This episode is sponsored by Assault Fitness. Assault has been a part of Power Monkey Camp for a long time. We've incorporated the runners, bikes, and rowers in our endurance sessions, as well as the competitions that we have at camp and our nightly workouts. Check out the full lineup of machines at assaultfitness.com. Welcome to the Power Monkey Podcast, where we chat with the best in the world about what they do. I'm your host, Dave Durante, with my co-host, Mike Service, and on today's episode, we have a return guest, Mr. Brian Chantash, also known as Tosh. It's great to have Tosh back on the podcast. Every time we have him on, he talks about another crazy physical feat he was able to accomplish, and most recently, he just completed rowing across the entire Atlantic Ocean with three other guys during the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge. This was an absolutely incredible story. Tosh has been training for over two years in preparation for this. He goes through what the preparations were like with his coach, meeting this new team, working together, some of the trials and tribulations that came along with such a crazy adventure being on the water for over 30 days. This is worth listening to, guys. You're going to learn not only about a very cool event that you're going to want to hear more about when it comes around next year, but also something you can take into your own training, into your own life. Every time I hear Tosh talk, I learn something new. I want to be a better person. I want to get out there and achieve a little bit more than I thought I was capable of. Enjoy this one. All right, Tosh, man, what's up? Uh, just off the air, we are talking about when the last time was that we we caught up. I can't believe it's been actually a couple of years now, but a lot has happened since the last time we have you, had you on. Uh, how things going, man? It's going well. Yeah, it's good to good to reconnect with you guys. You know, got the email a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, "Oh yeah, geez, man, love to love to touch base <laughs> and get to see Mike again." So uh, yeah, I'll talk to you guys anytime you want. Tosh, you can be honest. Appreciate though, that you, very much. Were Were you disappointed when you logged in and you didn't see Chad? <laughs> I don't. I know, am every man. time I log on and I I see you instead of Chad. I'm always disappointed. Yeah. He just sees his big, dumb, smiling face like uh, it's uh, over here, but we miss Chad. Yeah. So I think you're beautiful. We'll you're, you got great hair. Your teeth are like super perfect and white. It's like, <laughs> I'll talk to you any day of the week, man. This it's, is the, it's these filters I figured out how to put on. So don't, yeah. don't trust it. Don't trust anything. Right. <laughs> I might switch well, it's good to, to have you back Meet on, man. Because uh, Google Meet has some really nice filters. I don't use that, but then uh, <laughs> I get it. And then it does this thing across the screen. I'm like, wow, I'm kind of handsome. But uh, Zoom doesn't do that. Mike Mike <laughs> just bumps up the uh, handsomeness quotient of our team exponentially. That's why we have him around. Yeah. I'm still pretty confident that my mom paid Dave off like 10 years ago when I started to work for Power Monkey um, to like give me good feelings and uh, higher yeah, self-confidence. Checks are still coming in. Checks are still coming in. <laughs> you know, like when you're when you're you pay know, some of your salary <laughs> when you're the new kid at school. So then you have like the older sibling or like the parents that talk to everybody else to make sure you feel. I think I'm still riding that wave with Power Monkey. I gotta keep doing it, man. Don't stop. <laughs> we all need that from time to time. Well, speaking of teams and and things like that, um, I wanted to dive in on something that, you know, as I listen to you, to you talk on other podcasts and, you know, um, through your foundation and things like that, you know, leadership comes up a lot and just being a good leader and like just for myself, not even for the listeners out there, but I'm sure there are a lot of uh, listeners out there that are gym owners and, and um, coaches and leaders in their own communities and you seem to be someone that stands out as, you know, an epitome of what a leader is and what it can be and, and kind of how we can strive to be a better version of ourselves for the people around us. And my question revolves around the idea of how you get to that point. And for you personally, does the role of being a leader, is, is it something that you seek out or is it something that I'm going to be the person, the best version of myself, and I'm going to go out there every single day and try to become better at the things that I do and, you know, treat everything, you know, uh, how you do everything is how you do anything kind of mentality. And if that leads to people wanting to, and I know you prefer the word support over follow when it comes to, to being a leader, then I've succeeded. Uh, th this distinction between I'm going to be the best version of myself and that means I'm a leader awesome as opposed to actually seeking out being an actual leader. Does that, does that make sense in terms of those two uh, distinctions? It does. Uh, and it's a big 
encompassing, heavy, deep conversation too. You know, my, my background in the military, they groom you for leadership, right? They're always looking to identify certain traits, characteristics in individuals and set them up for increased responsibility. With increased responsibility, it requires some increased authority. And we, you're sort of groomed into being a leader, right? It's a it's like a goal end state. Hey, become a leader, become a leader, become a leader. And and that's fine, right? It's rank structure, it's military. Um I've grown to not try to be a leader. I, I don't I don't wake up every day and say, hey, what can I do to be a leader and be identified by the world as a great leader? I'm gonna bounce around a little bit and get that, but um I came to the Naval Academy a long time ago to the brigade of the ship and and I was supposed to be on leadership and I said, Hey, leadership, like we're all trying so hard to be leaders. We're all trying so hard and we're, we're missing it. We're, we're doing all these steps and there's all these pros and these gurus out there that this is what you do to be a great leader. And this is how great leaders lead. And this is the difference between leadership and management. And, and it's like, we're trying to practice all of these things to be something we're not to arrive, hoping that we'll end up becoming what we've become. You know what I mean? It's like, Hey, it's like trying to bake a stew and you're so focused on the end state of the stew that you are not really paying attention to the ingredients of what makes a good stew. And, you know, I said, Hey, what is leadership? It's, it's just not sucking at life. That's it. That's the key to leadership. Just don't suck at life. And it was like, Whoa, you know, this isn't professional military major or something talking. And, and then I boiled it down. I was like, how do you not suck at life? I don't know. Just be a good human being, you know, be a good motherfucker. Don't lie, cheat or steal, like treat others with common courtesy, decency, and respect. Like have some values in here that are, that are bigger than yourself that you would, you would ideal somebody else had that you would want to look up to, to, to emulate, to, to support focus there. And instead of trying to be a leader and get others to support you or follow you or do what you do, what you say to do, or this or that, like be something that others want to be around. They choose you, right? Like the, I don't, this is not true entirely, but like the best leaders, people choose them, not that they find themselves in a position. Now I'm a great leader. And why do you choose somebody to follow or to support, right? Why do you choose somebody as your leader? Well, because you believe in them, because they have these values that are just like, wow, that is great because they care about you, you know, because they they treat you with common courtesy, decent respect, they they love you. And so I think getting back to your your question as I distilled that question down is I don't I don't try to be a leader. I just try to be a really good human being. And what does a really good human being look like, act like, and understanding that we're all full of faults and you just do your best given your faults and you try to mitigate the, the egregiousness of our faults and just always trying to do better. Right. So you want to be a leader, don't suck at life and people will choose you. And then everything else just sort of fills in and supports that and helps you grow or, or learn and develop as a leader. But, you know, I also think that parenting is the ultimate leadership scenario. You know, if you're an engaged parent, you have children or you have cousins or nephews or your best friend has kids or whatever it is, like being a parental figure, like that is the ultimate leadership playground right there. And um, what you do and how you raise young adults and how you care about them and nurture them and try to get them to develop to become, you know, self-functioning, high, high-functioning people in society, that's the ultimate test of leadership right there. Everything else is just a, a, a mild application for some specific goal. Anyways, oh man, I, I, I couldn't I agree more said. about the, no, I couldn't agree more about that last piece about the parenting. How many, how many kids you have now, Tosh? Three. And you know, I, at large, I wasn't, I wasn't, I'm not a great parent, but um, for whatever reasons, but it's not for lack of want or try or, and I've probably become a better parent now that my kids are older and recognizing like, wow, I could have done so much better. I should be doing so much better. But um, yeah, I've got I think three. we all think that. I think That's we good. all think that. And yeah. I think if I, you're, I, I think if, 
I think if you're not thinking that, then you're probably um, failing a little bit. Like I think the moment that you're not thinking that you need to strive a little bit harder or you need to be better at whatever you're doing, you've probably entered that point of complacency where um, somebody else is going to do a better job than you, uh, whether it's in the you know parenting realm or um, which is, yeah, I like how you said that, Tosh, though, like that's the ultimate leadership role. And um, you can we, we can probably take that in a lot of directions soon. Sorry, Dave, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, not at all. I just uh, I, I've recognized that as a parent myself, like, I've gone through some challenging things physically in my life, you know, all, as we all have uh, as athletes and and push through barriers that maybe we didn't think we were physically capable of. And um, we became better because of those things. But becoming a parent is a completely different challenge. It, it's, it's a challenge like nothing I've ever had to face before. And it's made me recognize things that I never knew I would have to um, kind of confront and, you know, I wake up every day trying to be the best parent I possibly can. And inevitably I fail in multiple ways and, you know, and I could have done that better or, you know, I was exhausted and I probably could have read another book to my kids or, you know, instead of giving them pasta every single night because it's easy, I wish I could have given them something a little bit more nutritious. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I finish out the day always thinking I, I probably could have done something a little bit better for my kids today. And I'm constantly striving to be the best parent I possibly can and always feeling like, you know, I, I missed out on a little bit of something. And I don't think you can be a perfect parent, but parenting teaches you so much in terms of, like you said, that this this leadership quality of being able to maintain disorder, <laughs> like extreme disorder at all times. Like your kids are a little older, mine are three and six, and it's chaos chaos yeah. 100% of the time like 100% of the time you know i never i've never appreciated my parents to the degree that i've appreciated them later in my life and it makes me wish that i had appreciated them more uh, were my parents perfect no but i had i had great parents i had great parental figures or mentors that treated me you know that, that loved me more than i loved myself and um it's it's a shame that i've gotten this old in my life to recognize like how wonderful they were and it's uh it's a blessing and it makes you want to emulate them in a lot of regards or not do some of the things that they've done before and everything in the in this parenting sphere you can pull that lesson you can pull that slice and apply it to business you can apply it to the military you can apply it to sport you can apply it to and um but there's something really intimate about, you know, being an engaged parent. Um, I've, I said a minute ago, uh, you know, love me more than I love myself. Like that was a, a guiding paradigm for me when I was a commander in, in the military. It's like, I want to love my men more than they love themselves. Sometimes that looks like punishment, right? Because you know, or sometimes that looks like denying them an opportunity because they, they're not ready for it. Sometimes that's letting them stumble and fall in you know, not meet the goals or the standards to the degree that they thought they could, because they need to have a learning, learning point. And, um, all of those things, it's, it's truly, the more I think about it, you know, I even had a book. I, we probably talked about that book. Um, children learn what they live. I took that book. It was written by Dr. Nolte a long time ago. And it's, it's for young, young adults, you know, kids, but, um, I use that book and the themes throughout that book leading Marines, leading myself, engaging with relationships in, in the adult world. Um, it's just the basics, the simple, simple basics of being a good human being, treating others with common courtesy, decency, and respect, and allowing them to to grow through, through nurturing. And along those same lines, I've heard you talk about this a lot. I think it probably fits into that same, same mentality of leaving something better than you found it, right? And that can be even a relationship that can be you know, not just, you know, uh, picking up a piece of trash on the sidewalk, but also in terms of human interactions, right? Uh, leaving the person that you were interacting with maybe a little bit better than you found them in. And that means, you know, being kind, you know, uh, putting a smile on your face, trying to add some positivity to someone's life. And it seems like that mentality, if you can strive to put that into every facet of your life, is going to lead you down a path of, 
you know, just more success, more opportunity and uh, create that leadership kind of quality that just kind of resonates with others. Yeah, I think leaving it better than you found it, you know, started, we talked about it a little bit. I talk about it all the time. It's something that I have on my, one of my index cards, you know, it's a core, core belief of mine of the top three and um, leave it better than you found it. It was introduced to me in the military, you know, a simple physical world, like push your chair in, sweep the classroom out. Let's leave the classroom better than you found it. Whatever, you know, the, the, the rifle range, pick up brass, you shot 10 rounds, you should pick up 15 pieces of brass. And that means you made the world a little better. And it started to evolve into the relationship space and to where I'm at today with it is like, I dare you to find me going through the checkout line at a grocery store, not calling that person that's, that's checking out the, your groceries by their first name, looking them in the eye, asking them a question, how's your day going? What time did you start work? Oh my God, you got four more hours to go. You're going to get a break. Like just engaging with a human being or at a restaurant with your, with your, you know, the service industry, we have a tendency to really kind of be condescending and maybe it's not even intentional. It's like, oh, well, I'm here and I'm paying and you're going to serve me and I expect good service. And it's like, well, that's a, that's a sense of entitlement in disguise and calling the waiter or the waitress by their first name, engaging in conversation, you're going to get better service for it, right? Uh, they're not going to spit in your soup, but also you're leaving that person feeling better about themselves. Like, oh, wow. Like I believe in humanity. Again, we're surrounded with all this ugly shit going on. And it's like, I can be the source of light in somebody's worst day ever without even knowing it just by treating somebody with common courtesy, decency, and respect. And, um, and then I started to apply it towards myself. You know, you wake up in the morning, you, you scan yourself and okay, hey, cool. Like I'm going to leave myself better than I found, found myself this morning. And then when I go to bed at night, like, did you, did you leave yourself better than you found it this morning? Why or why not? Okay. Hey, cool. Like tomorrow I'm going to suck a little bit less at that. Um, or, Hey, good job today. And give yourself some grace for a job well done. And that in our world that working out every time that you go do a workout, right. You're leaving yourself a little better than you found it because you put yourself through something physical. You got the hormonal release, you it changes mood. It creates camaraderie with the people that you're working out with the health benefits. Um, and then just the challenge of working out and pushing yourself within your thresholds and maybe slightly beyond it. Um, so that you can continue to grow. These are all, these are all little mechanisms of leaving it better than you found it that are just kind of disguised as something else. But when you create an awareness to distill it down to what is it actually at the, at the onset, it is, it's leaving it better than you found it mentality. Now, now, now the challenges component there, you mentioned workouts and using workouts to kind of leave yourself a little bit better than you found yourself and growing as an athlete, whether that be, you know, whatever capacity that is, but there's a challenge component that you seem to really resonate with and like extreme challenges and, and things that other people would just find to be like absolutely insane. And you almost um, kind of seem to desire the, those extreme challenges. And the last time we had you on, you had just completed that 24 hour, you know, uh, race in the Connex box, destroying the other competitors in that one and just like putting it on another level with other people that were just incredible competitors themselves. And the first question here has to do with when when you are going after these challenges and seeking them out and saying, you know, this one is right for for me at this moment in time. Do you prefer individual challenges like that type of race? Or in this case that we're going to talk about in a second, team type challenges? Or do you find them both to be unique and different and a different type of challenge? Or it's kind of curious what you what you prefer in terms of how you like setting up, Ch setting up yourself mentally as an individual or the challenge that comes along with being part of a team? Yeah, I, I definitely prefer, I gravitate towards the small team stuff. I, I love being on a small team. I love, um, you know, the camaraderie, the, the shared common experience thing. I like having uh, strengths and weaknesses pitted against each other so that you can rise above things together. Um, the support, the social aspect, um, and, and largely, you know, if I'm really being honest in that dark space, like the, the safety and the security of it too. Right. Um, I've been seeking out a lot of individual stuff because it, it allows you to explore yourself in different ways. And so they're, they're, it's kind of cool to be able to do both. In fact, I shied away from doing a lot of individual stuff 
Um, and I came up with all these rationalizations why I wasn't built for individual stuff, you know? Um, and that just a light bulb clicked. Well, the reason I keep rationalizing is the exact reason I should be doing solo stuff. And so I started to explore a lot of the solo things to learn to be more self-reliant, more trusting, to expose some of those dark conversations that you have with yourself when you're struggling to create an individual resourcefulness, things like that. But um, I definitely enjoy both. But for sure, I would rather be doing something that I enjoy doing with somebody that I enjoy being with and sharing it together. Uh, I think we're social creatures. Um, and there's a lot of different things too, right? They, you know, having a teammate can pull you to be better than you would be by yourself. And then it's like, well, why do I need a teammate to be better than I would be by myself? Like I need to learn the skills to be better by myself, by myself. And so then I get caught in that whole little circle of things, but uh, <laughs> I would much rather be on a team. Um, and you know, the more you concentrate on somebody else and you care more about somebody else, the less that you become, um, uh, eh, not that you become, but the more you focus on others, the less you worry about yourself. And so then small aches and pains don't even matter. And you're all, you'll, it allows yourself to push through because you care so much about somebody else's aches and pains or, or whatever the case may be. And so it's a, it's a tool that I use caring more for others that allows me to ignore what's going on for me. And then, you know, that can be taken to an extreme and you become a liability if you're not actually focusing on what you should be focusing on for yourself in order to keep yourself at a, at a high level. But that team aspect is a, is a nice distraction um, from small petty things for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mike, you want to jump in? Cause I want to start getting into this, into the details about this race. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm absorbing a lot right now, Tosh. And then maybe I have some, some more questions when we get towards the end, but I like, um, and I think everybody that's listening will appreciate um, yeah, you come full circle on a lot of the things that you're talking about. So whether it's this, um, idea of liking to work with a team and then, you know, obviously, yeah, we are, we're so, we're, we are social creatures. So, um, as much as we feed into others, others can feed into us. And then, then when you find that you're, you know, breathing, uh, value and worth and positivity, whether it's into a server or somebody in a checkout line or your teammate, um, it automatically kind of elevates the aura around the group. Um, but then at the same time, if you're so focused on doing that, um, then eventually, you know, you've had your palm open and, and been giving so much that there's nothing left to give. So you have to kind of um, close back in and, and recharge. And I think that's, um, yeah, those are all thoughts to just to, for everybody that's listening, just to think about in different aspects of your life too. And, um, and, and decide like, uh, where are you at on that spectrum? Because it's, um, it's not an easy one to balance, but, you know, balance is what we, we seek, um, within, you know, the life that we're given. Yeah. The world seeks balance, whether we mm -hmm. are aware of it or not, you know, on, on yep. some time domain that maybe we're not even, you know, aware <laughs> of, but, um, you know, an empty, an empty well waters, no crops. You got to keep your well with water in it. Sometimes the yep. water, the water's a quarter, your quarter tank full. Sometimes you're full, full, but, um, you know, and I also get caught, you said something that I'm, I'm learning, uh, I get caught in this neurotic looping, you know, it's, I'm so, um, resistant to believing in my own bullshit. And I find that I start thinking about a certain thing and I'm so convicted that I believe in this, I believe in this, that I have to challenge it because I don't <laughs> want to believe in my own bullshit because I think we can self narrate. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't go unchecked through, internal dialogue, but also dialogue with really close friends or mentors or professionals, it can go in a direction that that's not pure. Right. And then you just become a repository of bullshit and you just, then you're adding negative value to the world with your own bullshit. You know, I say all the time to people that what you know is exactly in the way of you knowing, you know, we're so convicted on that. I believe this, I believe this, I believe this, that that prevents you from actually knowing whether or not you're perfect and accurate in what you believe in, or if you can refine it, or if you're wrong, or, you know, what I find is ultimately you find a different perspective that helps you reinforce the defense for what you believe in and maybe opens up a door to know what you believe in, given a different perspective. 
you know, this mm-hmm. last weekend we had a diesel day and I was talking to people and I said, Hey, you know, you're out there and you're all alone. And if you always live this life of knowing what you know, you're going to come across a situation where what you know isn't going to solve what you need to solve. Even though you have the right answer, but you just don't know what you know from the right perspective to finesse it to solve where you're at. So if if I'm if I'm with you gentlemen and I just listen to understand and and it helps me form what I know from different perspectives, your your experience is much different than mine, all of ours collectively different than each other. I might know the same answer, but arrive at it from a different angle. And I'm gonna be in a in a situation that I cannot predict in my life. And I'm gonna be like, oh, you know what? Like when I was on that Power Monkey pro- podcast, those guys, they believe the same thing I did, but they were coming at it from a different angle. Let me solve this problem from that angle because I know I have the right answer for this, but I just have the wrong method to get, to arrive at, and then I'll then I'll succeed. And so, mm-hmm. um, knowing what you know is exactly what's in the way of knowing, you know, <laughs> what you what you could or how you could or why Tosh. you should. <laughs> Tosh, I love I love that. There's um. There's a, a guy that I listen to uh, certain times, and um, he'll say that uh, the greatest sin is the sin of certainty. Um, so the moment that you have that, um, you know, you're very likely looking at the wrong vantage point or from yeah. the wrong vantage point. And if you're so certain, you're not willing enough to just rotate a little bit and maybe see from a, a different angle. And um, that's, uh, yeah, that's something that's uh, always interesting to think about, because uh, we might change our perspective um, from the most unlikely encounter with the most unlikely person. Um, and and oftentimes it's, uh, which I think you're probably a good example of is like getting out of our comfort zones, like when we're around the same people all the time, even if they're great people. Um, yeah, sometimes we can get these blinders on that, that really limit um, an opportunity to just be, be more, be better and, um, elevate things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You say it way better than I do. <laughs> I think <laughs> it's also exactly about it. like, uh, being able to surround yourself by people who can call you out, out on your shit mm-hmm. that you trust. Right. To yeah. be able to say, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, like, does it make sense? Or like, explain that to me better because the way you're saying it doesn't fully resonate. And so being able to actually have people around you that are just not just constantly telling you yes and challenge you on things, I think is an important piece of it too. So a close knit team uh, is such a critical part of being able to expand that understanding of, you know, what is certain and what is not. Yeah. I'm pretty critical, you know, maybe hypercritical of these little boy bands that you see out there and social media. And it's like, Oh, Mm. there's this little, this little boy band click and all they do is blow each other. And it's because nobody's, (laughs) nobody wants to call somebody else on their own bullshit. Yeah because they don't want to be called on their bullshit. So we're going to surround right. ourselves with this bro network and we'll, we'll build each other up so that, and that, that, that could be the worst possible thing. I want to be surrounded with people that are going to question or challenge in, in a good, healthy way mm-hmm. so that you don't become this down this path. And it's like, how did I get here to be in a douchebag? you know? Yep. Um, but anyways, that's neither here nor there, or maybe it is, but <laughs> Let's move on from that. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about let's talk about this team that uh you guys formed together for this uh absolutely insane race that you guys uh, did a few months back. First of all, who initiated uh the the idea to participate in this? So it was you and three other seals uh coming together for 3000 miles across the Atlantic. Who whose idea was it and uh did you have to be talked into this? Yeah. Um Brian Nicholson, he he was our team captain. He um I'd never met Brian. He and uh a buddy that he worked with in the governments, uh, they wanted to do something really cool. It'd been on his mind for a while. He wasn't he's not a stranger to ultra endurance stuff and and doing cool shit. And they got together and they said, Hey, what this this Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge roll across the ocean and they were gonna do it as a duo. And then like kind of the standard race class is four person. Uh, it's an expensive race. How can we, let's do a team of four, help with the cost. Let's get some fundraising, you know, um, let's compete in the category, the race category. That's the sexiest something, something. And they reached out to a friend of mine, um, the late Dan Cirillo, who just passed away um, a couple of weeks ago. And he gave up 
uh, they, they basically emailed them and said, Hey, do you know anybody that'd be crazy enough to do something stupid and really hard? And taco said, yeah, Hey, like here's two names. And they reached out to another gentleman and, and our names came up. And so we got on this interview call with, um, Jim and Brian, and it was a good buddy of mine, Chris Smith, probably my closest buddy. Yeah. You guys are probably familiar with Chris Smith. You can't not be, um, and so we got on a video call and as individuals and sort of got interviewed. And then next thing you know, we're getting on another group call and it's all four of us. I'm like, Oh, Chris, like, Holy shit. Like go figure, you know, we, Chris <laughs> and I've raced all over the world together too. And we're really close. And, um, I didn't really know that we were going to row across an ocean. I thought we were going to do something really hard, something challenging, design something. Maybe we're going to try to hike across the Rockies in the middle of the winter or do something wild and extreme. And um, slowly the conversation, hey, have you ever guys heard of the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge? It's row a boat across the Atlantic Ocean. It's like, that's crazy. And so I had to sit on it for a little while. And what made it even crazier is um, somehow it was decided we should try to row for the world record. Like, why not? Like, none of us have any experience ocean rowing. It just makes sense that we're going to try and <laughs> be that, you know, <laughs> arrogant that we're going to set a world record. And I thought about it for a while and bounced it off on Nicole and uh, she wasn't the biggest fan of this. That, that was going to be my question, Tosh, was uh, how was that topic brought up to Nicole and what was her initial response? Yeah, I don't think I told her right away. Um, and then <laughs> she was not keen on it. Uh, Andrea, Chris's wife, was less keen than Nicole. So, um, but we, we, we did, and we had tremendous support from both our wives. So that was good. And, uh, we committed at that point to, uh, to row across the Atlantic ocean with the ambition of rowing, like we were going to try and set a world record, give it all, you know, for, for two and a half years of training, we were going to prioritize this as the thing that we were going to do. And so the training part, that's the part that I'm, I'm absolutely curious about. You mentioned not having open water experience and you brought in a, a coach, project manager, Angus Collins. Can, I'm, I'm curious what, what this guy, Angus, brought to the equation that was able to, to figure out the, the type A, four type A personalities that comes along with this to be able to turn you guys into a squad that worked together in a task that you had never really worked together uh, on before to be able to achieve something li like this? What, what, what did he have? Why did you guys seek him out as the right fit for this? Yeah, we um, originally we started, you know, resourcing some people to help us with, you know, the fundraising for the boat and equipment, you know, concept to came across a guy named Gus Barton who um, trains, ocean rowers in ocean rowing um physically so their workout programs and stuff and then when we finally got our boat was finished building and it arrived in florida we thought we were just going to figure it out and realize okay we got a lot more to learn than we knew we had to learn and so gus made a recommendation to to brian like hey there's this guy he was a teammate of mine uh, during an ocean row when they set the world record a handful of years ago, Angus Collins. And so Brian reached out to him and said, Hey, would you mind, you know, can we fly you? We'll pay you, you know, whatever it costs to come and train with us for a week in Florida and get us positioned to at least have an opportunity to be successful, you know, know what we don't know and, and start onboarding some skills. And we met Angus in Amelia Island and the dude is cool. Just he's legit. Um, now then we start to learn a little bit more about Angus. He's rode the Pacific. He's rode the Atlantic twice. He's rode the Indian ocean. He's got world records. Um, he's basically known as the guy in the ocean rowing community. And, um, he's, he's living, lives in London and coincidentally enough, he's the guy that worked at Rannick Boatyard, built our boat, um, or had, a, had a significant hand in building the boat. Um, he was significant in the technology of the, the the r45 boat itself and the upgrades as it's progressed over the years so it's like wow this dude's cool and he just kind of fit with us He's just a dude's dude and so we pitched to him it's like hey would you be our campaign manager like you want to own this team for us and 
help us through this, you know, the, all the logistics, all the planning, all the travel, all of the training, you name it, you know, and he said, yes, and he, he was, if it weren't for Angus, we would have completed the row, no doubt, but with a hundred X more struggle and effort required. <laughs> and I think he recognized something in us, um, the potential and you know, largely our ignorance, but our, our force of will and our camaraderie as a team, he was really fascinated with that. Angus runs a company called Beyond Endurance, and he's on a world speaking tour and, and talks. He uses largely his experiences in the ocean rowing world to talk about leadership and development and resiliency. And so he came on board, you know, and um, the dudes, I just can't praise Angus enough. Uh, he's he's that good. And the people that he put us in touch with and his network to help us set up for success and the organizational skills and the technical knowledge to turn us into um, amateur ocean rowers to be able to compete in this race was incredible. Did you go to him and say, hey, we, we've never done this before and our goal is to set the world record? Yeah, basically we told him that and he's like, <laughs> you're trying to break my record. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he believed in us and, you know, to have somebody with that experience, background, credibility, believe in us, helped us believe in ourselves as well. So um, you can't undervalue the, the power of belief, right? Uh, without a doubt, without a doubt. And obviously um, the, the mental strength and the physical strength that you guys have as a, as a, a quad is, uh, you know, can't be discarded as well. So 33 days on the boat, just the four of you, right? Angus is not on the boat with you at all. It's just the four of you navigating this entire trip. Correct. Angus was shore based in London. Uh, he was, he was there for the launch for the start of the race. He came to Florida a couple of times, Cal, uh, Colorado a couple, uh, once to, to help us do training and, and work together. And, but when we started the race, he was the only comms we had with him was sat phone and, um, GPS text messenger. Now I'm sure there were expected challenges along the way. Um, what were some unexpected challenges that you had to kind of overcome along the way that you had no, no idea would be kind of thrown at you. You know, uh, we, we prepared Angus did a great job of preparing us. Um, he did these things called scenarios at sea for us and he would ask us questions and then we would build plans and ideas. It's like, I never would have thought of that. I never would have thought of that. Like he walked us through the boat, you know, knit and tit, like front up, front back, on all the systems, what could go wrong? This is likely to go wrong. That's likely to go wrong. And so we were largely prepared for a host of contingencies. Um, but solving a situation given the conditions was something that is unexpected. You know, when you have 30 plus foot waves and your tiller goes out and then you dark out like, Hey, I got it. This is how I would do it. But, in the actual situation, the energy is different. The, the, all of the other things that are going on, it's like, wow, I can do this from the, from the desk and solve and answer these questions. I can do this while we're training and, and do this, but not given these conditions. So um, I think the auto tiller failure that we had during massive seas was a, was a really big test. Um, our battery, we had, we had a battery fault. Um, you know, we, we, we worked through that pretty well and we came up with a solution that wasn't perfect, but it was solving for the needs. And if the needs increased beyond our solution, we had a backup plan to solve, but we never needed to go to a, the backup backup plan. And one of the, one of the big things though, was the psychological breakdown. For me, it, I was surprised and it was unexpected. The psychological breakdown of, of a couple of teammates, you know, um, I wasn't ready for that to that degree. You know, we can all expect there to be psychological breakdown of all of us. And it happened. All of us had these breakdowns, um, but, but some of them were a little bit more significant than I expected them, but uh, it wasn't unmanageable. I mean, we still a great team, great relationships, great camaraderie and uh, you know, great success. You know, we finished in, in a, in a really, really respectable time. And um, probably the other thing was the quality of our competition 
based off of his historical times and records and and whatnot like we put up a really really good row 33 and a half days you know any other year that would have been a first place finish or top two this year it was like wow you know the field really grew and was really really strong and we're putting out this work capacity um it, i like to say brute force and ignorance right that's kind of how we solved everything just with brute force and ignorance and a lot of the other teams had a lot more technical skill <clears throat> than the brute force and we just you know tried to re rely on that to to even the playing field but um these other teams the work output that we were putting in that they were putting in we didn't expect to have to maintain that effort for as long as we did to just be marginally competitive was wild. It was absolutely wild. Um, and so these other teams, like I really, really hats off to the Spanish team. I mean, those guys, uh, they, we, we were, we were eyeing them up. It was like, okay, it's going to be us and the Spanish. We're going to crush these guys. They're 110 pounds soaking wet. You know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're pure Spanish. They, they're a little bit different than we are. You know, we're, we're military. They're this, and you know, just, just bullshit stuff that you just kind of attach to and use as sources of motivation. And, um, but they, they had total power failure at like day 13 or day 12. It was right before I was like two days before Christmas and they had total power failure on their boat. And we got a text message saying the Spanish might be out of the race. And it's like, Oh, cool. These are number one. We got one other boat then that we're, we need to worry about. And we're gonna we're gonna break those guys, no problem. Let's just go. Let's just grind. It sucks for these for the Spanish team. Like our hearts went out to them. You spend two years training and all of this, and then on day twelve you have, just have this fault that's totally not under your control. And they were gonna have to get rescued. And they persevered through twelve or fifteen, twelve to fifteen hours of total boat failure. And they came back and they won the race. They lost wow. almost 20 kilometers of distance at a point in the race where usually it's already decided who the top three finishers are going to be. You know, we're at like 800 miles in and um, they rallied. They solved it. They, I mean, the composure that they must have had, the teamwork, the camaraderie, the resiliency, the determination, and then to fix, fix the problem and realize that you just gave up 20 miles, right? And you're almost halfway through the race to try to make up 20 mile. And they just, they did not let it get to them. They just dug their heels in more and they just boom, 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 boom. And they win the race, you know, not by a fraction of a margin either. They, they won the race considerably. And what's really cool is at, it was Christmas day, um, late in the afternoon, starting to get dusk and we have our nav lights on and all of a sudden on our chart plotter, we get a ping that the Spanish team is just off of our um, our uh, starboard side. And so we start looking and then you can just see a little tiny piece of green, you know, and then it disappears for 10 minutes until you, you get on the same incident of a wave swell and you're both up high. And then it's like, oh, you see them and they're less than a mile away, you know, probably three quarters, half mile away. And um, it's like, oh, and we're neck and neck with them. And we're racing and it's like, man, those fucking guys, they must be spent the amount of effort that they had to put in to make up that distance. They got to be spent. Hey, let's go. We're using that as a source of motivation. And then our auto tiller fails. And on their chart plotter, they're seeing the same thing, obviously. Right. And then all of a sudden they see our track, like our boat go off in a different direction. And there's mass chaos on our boat at this time. It's pitch black out boat sideways, 30 plus foot waves lose control of steering the boats i think we're capsizing um we break a oar lock we bend an oar plate um brace um our concept two oars never broke those things were brilliant i think our concept two oars saved us from capsizing as it got pinned under the boat when we were broached but uh i'm down in the in the, the stern cabin trying to sort out auto tiller and steer and figure out the fault and fix it and then the radio comes off you know in the spanish uh, you know, team shut up and row, team shut up and row. This is so and so. Da, 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 da. How are you doing? You okay? And it's like, I'm putting on my best combat voice, right? Like everything's super <laughs> cool. I mean, it is chaos. 
uh, on the boat at this point. And I'm just like, oh, hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? Yeah, man, everything's good. Merry Christmas. Oh, okay. Hey, how are you doing? Doing great, man. Hey, have a good voyage. You know, I'm talking to these guys. But they were concerned enough when they saw our track go wonky that they decided to reach out and just check and make sure we're okay. What great human beings those guys were, are, Amazing. you know? Um, just so cool. And of course, hang up the radio and then it's just back to mass chaos, you know, 40 mile an hour <laughs> winds and can't hear shit and people yelling and, you know, boat doing all kinds of weird shit. But uh, I can't, I can't think highly enough of the Spanish team and I'm looking forward to connecting with them. I, I want to make a trip back to Barcelona on my next hunting trip to Spain and um, ring those guys up and spend a day with them and go to dinner and just talk like what was, you know, I, I pride myself on, on the, the mental field, right. Of the mental space of resiliency, grit, being hard, all that stuff and um, leadership. And it's like, I want to pick their brains on how they managed what they managed when they had their power failure. Cause we, I think we managed it really, really well, but I won't sit and lie to anybody and say, I think it affected us all some to a much greater degree than others, the psychological game of, okay, Hey, let's keep going. Let's keep winning, you know? Um, but it put a loop and then we had, we had auto tiller failure for four days in a row and, um, oh. until we could get that finally solved. And I just really think that the sea states and the conditions we were in were pushing the mechanical capabilities of that system beyond what it was designed for. And we were just taxing the shit out of it. And, um, it just, it, no fault of the auto tiller it just was stressed in a situation that it was not designed for, you know? And, um, I mean, we were in, we were in some big, big stuff. Gosh, I'm yeah, like, get uh, Go ahead, I'm like, it's I'm almost, I'm almost, yeah, I'm like almost sweating over here, imagining it because I, I, I don't really like water. I hate roller coasters and I'm just, and I'm just imagining all all of this in one. Um, and I also don't like to, um, uh, put off, uh, the feeling of anxiousness. So then sometimes that's like double work <laughs> yeah. to try. Um, I, I, I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I just want to put that out there that like, I have, um, like anxious sweats right now thinking about that. Um, but on a, on a, uh, equally important, but less, uh, deep comment. And then Dave, I'll let you get deep. Uh, when you go to Barcelona, um, tell me because I have my favorite steak place in the world that you can take them all to. And then you guys can talk about this. It'll be the best tomahawk perfect. steak you have that cooks right in front of you on a hot stone. Oh, that'd so. be perfect, man. I'd love it. You know, right. you know, you mentioned that anxiousness and I've had this question before, like, what are we feeling? Like, were you afraid or fear or anything? And, you know, I wasn't, and I'm really, really careful about selective recollection and, mm. and not being selective in, in, um, you know, looking back and reflecting on things. And why wasn't I like, I was spooked, no doubt. I was a spooked, but it never reached fear or anxiety. And I, and I have to say that that's because of the teammates that I was with. Okay. I mean, right, right away, I'm, I'm on a boat with three Navy SEALs. Right. I don't have to swim. I'm going to be fine. They're going to swim me to shore. Right. I've got a life jacket and I've got these three highly functioning, awesome dudes that problem solve, have seen shit, been through shit and the way everybody acted and worked together to solve, even given their own level of spook, spook, spookedness. Um, it's soothing, right. To be in the company of men like that. Uh, that's, it's so powerful. It's, it's such a luxury that I've had um, across a lot of my endeavors and, and experiences in life, military, non-military. But, um, you know, hats off to those guys. If I would have been way more, you know, shit's crick if I was just there by myself. <laughs> I wouldn't have known what to do. Curl okay. up in a little ball and put the life jacket on and cross your fingers. But um, being surrounded by amazing human beings allows you to be amazing yourself. And every time I hear yourself talk or anyone else that has had like a decorated military career, I'm always like, I'm fucked myself. Like if anything ever happens to me, like I need to be around, like, absolutely. I need to have like 10 seals around me if I'm going to ever figure anything else out. Like I am incapable of doing anything. Every time I, I hear your stories and I hear what you're, what the, the, the things that you're able to navigate. And I'm like, 
is the only way to learn those things to actually go through the military because if it's if it is that i'm totally my 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 ability to to navigate tough situations is just gone i am not able to do it well you know it's not the mil- only the military you know i've done yeah. adventure races i had a t- i have a teammate his name is tim Coonster. i've raced patagonia new england primal quest um australia god zone in new zealand i've raced all over the world with this guy sweden and he doesn't have one military piece of energy in that dude's body. You would look at him and, I mean, that's one of the toughest dudes I know. That's a guy that can navigate some shit mentally. And he's not like this physical specimen either. You know, he's he's kind of tiny, scrawny, but um, that guy's hard. That guy's hard. And I've been around, uh, there's a couple females that I, I work with. I'll take Brista Mayfield. Doesn't have a day in the military. I will put Brista Mayfield mentally against anybody that I've served with or performed with in, in the military that has military background or out of the military that has military background. She's that good. And so I don't think it's a function of the military. I think the, the military can help put you in situations to help you expose yourself to you and skills and development through the situations in the environment but I don't think it's um, a requirement that it's just military people that have it. And I've met plenty of milk toast motherfuckers in the military. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's just, it's just, do we have, are we creating opportunities in our life to continually grow? You know, my, my, my body of work of, of doing hard things and harder things and harder things, you know, exposing the margins, you know, to use the CrossFit methodology thing, you know, just continue to expand your margin to different movements, different exercises, different scenarios, situations to different degrees. And, um, it's, it's that, that we get there and you don't get there in just two events. It's a, it's a, it's been 30 years of this stuff, 35 years of doing these things to get to where I'm at to today. And um, largely, I would suggest that that's probably the case for most of the hardest people that you know in your life. Yeah, I don't doubt it. And I'm super curious now to know what the backgrounds are of that Spanish team. Like, I want to know what those guys, how they prepped for it. I want to know more about those guys. And I mean, if they were well, the best of you guys, they got to get some, they had some special going on. So yeah. triathletes, seems like it's a little scrawny, uh, mini, scrawny little Spanish yeah. triathletes. And <laughs> they were good. They were great. Yeah. They were great. Yeah. And beautiful people too. Like amazing. In in Gamera, right before the race, they were very reserved. They were very focused. They were not social. You know, they hung themselves, but they were goal committed. And that's the way that they manifest their team. They were very, very tight as a team. You could tell that. Um, we were a little bit more loosey goosey, you know, a lot of social with the other teams, making relationships, fun loving, this or that, you know, confident as well. And um, it was almost like a standoffishness. They were never rude or anything, and we were never rude back. There was just a, a an insulation between us and the Spanish team. And our boats were parked right next to each other on land during all of the training and all of the pre-checks and, and the gear fit-outs and the inspections. And then our boat was parked next to them when we got in the water for a handful of days. So we were we were right next to them. And you could tell, oh, we're going to beat you. We're going to beat you. And it had that energy, you know, and um, after the race, when I saw them in Antigua, they couldn't have been more warm, more friendly, more cool. Um, the hugs that you gave each other, like the sit down and the conversation you had with each other, you you knew that these were beautiful people. They were just so focused. And um, there's something really special about that, that uh, you have to respect, you know, you can't ignore that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now we're getting towards the end here. And I feel like every time that we chat, the hour goes by like blink of an eye, like we keep right, talking talk and much. no, no. man, it's, it's awesome. It's the, it's just the quality of the conversation. I appreciate it. But uh, one of the things that we, we, we got here in our notes uh, just for the purposes, curious if you remember, but uh, we have it in here that uh, one of the guys on the team, Brian's uh, daughter had a different joke that she wanted to be told on the boat each day, just kind of keep spirits up. Do you remember any of those jokes that, uh, it's <laughs> were told that you're asking me that I've been trying to rack my brain, um, for the last couple of days. Cause some, a joke came up with uh Brista's son. He's a, a 10 year old and he was saying jokes. And, um, so she, Brian's daughter wrote down 10, 21 jokes 
um, on a notebook for Brian to read to the team. And he, you know, we, we didn't know how long we were going to be. We weren't going to be 21 days. So we knew we'd have to redo a bunch of, uh, uh, jokes, but, um, they were, she's, she's a young girl, you know, I think she's eight, maybe, maybe she's not even quite eight yet, but, uh, they were just so much fun. And, and every day we'd look forward to, Hey, is it time for a joke? No, not today. You know? And then we would get the jokes and then be like day six. Can we remember joke one through five? Like, Oh, you can't, you know? And, um, but it created such a great mood, man. I, I wish I could, um, remember the jokes and I, I will, I'm having some problems here these last few days, um, for whatever reasons in my head, and I have to get that sorted out, but, um, it's been affecting a lot of the things I've been doing lately. Um, but it'll come back. It's just, a I go, these cycles that I go through with my head stuff. So, but, um, it's funny because Bo, you know, Bo Mayfield, he, uh, he had a joke for us during the diesel day this last weekend. And I was like, Oh, that's brilliant. You know, I can't even remember the joke that he said, but it was really good. <laughs> and then it made me thinking about, the jokes that we had on the boat. And you, of course you ask me that question and I can't produce. <laughs> no worries. No worries. There's probably more meant for you guys anyway, just to be able to get through that craziness. Oh, here's, here's, here's one. I just got it. You just care. Why did the Turkey cross the road? Why? To prove that he could do it. <laughs> and it sounds like, okay, hey, you know, but when you're alone, with just the yeah, four that's of you motivating. For, on day 20, you, you laugh hysterically. Oh my God, that's the greatest joke uh, in the world. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. With a 60 year old daughter myself who has a little joke book, I can appreciate uh, what goes into creating 21 for uh, a group of four men going on an adventure. Yeah. Um, what What's next for you, man? Uh, do you already have something taking some time off. I can't imagine someone like yourself really is. You're already kind of planning the next, the next uh, thing on the agenda. Do you have it planned out already? I've got uh, two, three ideas. Uh, it won't happen this year. It'll be next year. Um, there's an itch that needs, is still itching with this row, potentially do the Pacific, potentially do the Atlantic again. Um, we'll see. Uh, I'm back and forth on that. I have another one, another isolation challenge that I'd like to do with an audience. Um, you know, obviously all to raise awareness for the Big Fish Foundation and, and tackle some of these mental issues and the impact against suicide is our mission. But, um, you know, largely I'm focused on the three things that I've had to downgrade in priority over the last three years. You know, my relationship, my relationships, um, not only with, with Nicole and my children, but my closest friends and, you know, those, I don't want to say that they suffered, but they were put on a back burner as I was being ridiculously selfish for the row. Um, the Big Fish Foundation is is on the, is on the priority list as well. And then um, Crooked Butterfly, specifically the Hardway Project that we launched April 1st. So those are, those are the three big things I'm really pouring everything I can into um, this year in an effort to give back for how selfish I was for the last two and a half, three years. But um yeah, there's there's physical challenges. You know, I, I was talking. We're gonna go over. Um, we'll, we'll, you'll have to do this as part one and two, maybe. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> going to CrossFit, right? Like to Greg Glassman and, and all of his models and things like that, um, and the methodology. And he, you know, how he would draw this circle on the board, and it would have like it wouldn't be perfect circle. It'd have some this or that, and then he drew a little stick figure in the middle, and that was you and inside the boundaries of that amoeba shaped thing was your margins, right? Like it was your capabilities, the things that you knew that you were developing capacity to. And he, he supposed that the best way for growth specifically when in his analogy was the physical fitness world, right? Um, you have to expose yourself to new and unique things, the unknown and the unknowables are the stuff that you would normally not want to do. So it's like, Hey, if you're just a, a Monday bench press, you know, buys and tries on Tuesday and legs on Wednesday kind of guy and you hit shoulders on Thursday and that's all you know, well, maybe you need to do this and this and this. Or if all you know is barbells, maybe you need to play with dumbbells and you just need to constantly make your margins bigger and bigger. Time domain, you know, efforts, tasks, time priority, all, all that stuff. And, and the, the bigger we can build our margins, right, our expansive capacity, the better we'll be successful against the unknown and the unknowable you know, largely the outside world at any task. And, you know, he had his, his models for fitness and testing and all that. And I've been looking at that and I've lived my life ever since being exposed to CrossFit with the knowledge of that language, but also I believed in it before then. And that's why I think 
this methodology stuff resonated so much with me. I've constantly been trying to move my margins out and my margins, I'll say this with, with zero ego are quite big right now. And in order to do something outside of my margins, um, in order to do a lot of things outside of my margins that I want to do, you require a tremendous amount of time to be able to do right. The, the margins are so big, unless I pick up a, a brand new sport, which is still outside the margins. And I start there. Um, but I've been living my life outside my margins or right at the margins for so long. And then I just kind of had this revelation while I was on the rowboat was like, Hey, wh what's wrong? What's wrong with making the decision, not rationalizing comfort. Right. But, but making the decision to come well back inside of my margins and do this that I've built so much capacity at and, and downgrading and staying inside of here, but doing it with somebody else that maybe that's more towards their margins. And I can, I can do these things with people that I love the most, because let's face it, like most of the people that I care about, I spend the most amount of my time. They're not able to, to do these things. And what I want to do is I want to share experiences with people that I love inside the capacities that we can both enjoy them in order to focus on that relationship and the experiences and, and still enjoy, right? I don't have to go on a hundred mile hike Right. I can go on a five mile hike with Nicole and the dogs and be well with inside my margins and, and feel really, really good. So when I got off the row, I made the commitment to, Hey, you're going to come back way inside your margins and surround yourself with the people in there to do the things that you both enjoy or all of you enjoy for different reasons, not because you're constantly seeking growth, you know, constantly seeking growth, whatever it is, the physical, the psychological domain, it's exhausting. And the more you do it, the more it takes to do more. And I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to take a few steps back. It's not because I'm lazy. It's not because I don't have ambition. It's not because I'm using some excuse that I'm getting old or, or all that other bullshit. That's just bullshit rationalization. I'm making the deliberate decision that I want to do this so that I can enjoy it with the people that I enjoy the most. So that's really where I'm at this year, um, focusing on those things. That, Tosh, that makes so much sense to the whole philosophy, though, because it's like once you've expanded out into these margins so far, you have margins within your margins. <laughs> so it's like even if you imagine it like a little kid, you know, coloring, and it's like, I just want to get out as far as I can and get everything going. But you've got empty spots all through there. That now yeah. you can go in like with a little, you know, finer tip brush and start to, you know, color those in. And I think that's, yeah, you're just, um, yeah, you, you've had a unique um, process of doing that. But but I think all of us probably can relate to that in a sense of um, we can reach to try and grow so much, but then um, you can always, you know, um, inhale and breathe back in and then kind of start again and and bring more people with you, which is cool where you're, you're saying that, like, you know, look at everybody else and um, see where their margins are and then kind of take a shared approach to it. Yeah, I like that a lot. I like recoloring and redoing and reliving some of the good stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not to say that I can't make the decision again further down the road to go back yeah. out either. You know, but the, the 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 big thing is is I'm making a decision that's well thought out for the right reasons instead of going on a whim or a feeling and going with some flow. You know, I'm I'm taking ownership of of where I want to be and why, and it's not an excuse for anything. And I think the the you're, you're mentioning that uh, growth uh, suffers if you stay within the margins, but it sounds like relationship growth is still very possible and still within the margin that will allow allow you to continue to grow as a person just with the others around you. And I think that that's as critical as any individual growth that you're going to, you know, seek out outside yeah. those margins. So, um, yeah, I know you're going to find what you're looking for, man. It just uh, takes another journey to be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a 2d model when Greg draws it on the whiteboard, but really it's a 4d, 5d model. In, sure. in conceptualization and um, recognizing maybe some of the other dimensions of the margins is maybe that's even better way of thinking about it, but I can't quite think past 2d right now. So <laughs> understandable, understandable. Well, um, I know we always put it out there to you and uh, we were close to getting you out at the camp at, at the power monkey camp uh, at some point in the past. And 
having you share some of your knowledge with the campers and um the invitation is still always out there for you man just to come and just hang you know uh just an ex experience uh, the group that we have out there it's uh it's a really special group of people that you know um can maybe help along with this journey of staying within the margins a little bit so uh, i know you got your 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 family and your close friends but just know that uh, the Power Monkey community would love to to be able to share a little bit of that with you too if you ever get a chance to come out and be with us. Yeah, let's get it on the calendar for next year. Let's do it sooner than later so we can get the space blocked off before it gets filled in. And it's something that I really want to do. We were really close to coming out a handful yep. of years ago and you're still doing it in Tennessee, just yep. outside of uh, Cookville. And Yeah, about 20, yeah. 30 minutes outside of, the, uh, outside of Cookville, yep, in Crossville. Yep. So we'll uh, let's there, do that. Uh, let's let's be committed to doing that um, next year and coming out and spending a day or two. And uh, you know, I'm always looking to to meet the people that share the same thought processes that I do. Just haven't had the luxury of meeting them in person yet. And you can make some great friendships and bonds and have some great impact when you when you do that. So, without a doubt, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. Now, before we get you out of here, you know, you mentioned Big Faust, uh, Big Fish Foundation a little bit, and. Crooked Butterfly, but where where can people actually find you in the foundation? Uh, we can direct our listeners to uh, what you got going on. Yeah, we've got a new website getting ready to get launched here in the next two weeks, um, www.bigfishfoundation.org. Um, we have a website up now, um, but we're, we're getting ready to go through a, a brand new polish and um, present that. You know, on Instagram, it's at bigfish underscore foundation and you can see what we're doing there we're doing some great work with some veterans we've got a really exciting transition time for us as a nonprofit, and and to grow a little bit and um continue offering new programs and one of the big exciting things that I'm, i want to talk about since i can um is is we do a lot of work for the veteran but what about the veteran support network you know their spouses significant others or children so we're going to open up a new host of programs in the next year where not only the veteran themselves come, but the significant other or two that are in their lives and in, in affecting the change because it's it's those individuals that care so much about the veteran that are back at home. They are also going through mm -hmm. some things. So if we can tackle two two birds, one stone, but also create the connection and deepen and strengthen the connection uh, between the, the the two enterprises, you know, uh, I think we're setting ourselves up for success even to a greater degree. So that's exciting to launch. Um, and then Crooked Butterfly, it's our, um, it's my profit business that teaches leadership through experiential learning. And you can find that at crookedbutterfly.com. And then uh, Instagram, it's just uh, Crooked Butterfly. So um, that's really where you can find both of those um, endeavors of mine. And, and then my personal Instagram page kind of pulls and leverages that network uh, for both of those organizations. So Perfect, man. We'll make sure we get our listeners out there and supporting as much as we can. Uh, obviously, you're doing so many great things within the community of Cross of it also uh, with those veterans. And it's such an important thing that we need to make sure people know more about. So uh, thank you for all you're doing. And thank you again for your time, man. I know you're a busy dude. And uh, we really appreciate speaking with you. Yeah, great. Likewise, man. It's always good to connect with some, some quality humans, man. You guys are awesome. Um, appreciate you all. Thanks, Tosh. Appreciate the time. For all our listeners out there, please be sure to head over to PowerMonkeyFitness.com for services and upcoming events. We have our Power Monkey Camp. It's most likely going to be going on as this podcast podcast is going out. We are the start of our 10th year. 2023 is our 10-year anniversary, so please check out PowerMonkeyCamp.com for more information about our fall camp. Also, check out our Instagram pages for regular teaching and technical content at Power Monkey Fitness, at Dave Durante, and at Mike Service. On behalf of Power Monkey Fitness, we're your hosts. I am Dave Durante with my co-host, Mike Service. And until next time, thank you all for listening.